Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Wherever you are joining us from, welcome to the RSET training, Satellite Remote Sensing for Urban Heat Islands. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'll be co-leading today's training with my colleague, Dr. Amita Mekber. This introductory training on urban heat islands will be over subsequent Tuesdays in the month of November. The first part of the webinar series covered today is focused on land surface temperature based urban heat island mapping. We hope you will join us for all three parts of the webinar series. Over the course of the webinar series, there will be three one and a half hour long sessions each Tuesday that will include both a presentation and a question and answer session. The same content will be presented at two different times each day for participants in different time zones. The first session is at 10 a.m. Eastern Time in the United States, and the second at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Please only sign up for and attend one session per day. Below is a link to the RSET webpage for this training. From the webpage, you will be able to access the recordings, presentations, and homework for all three parts of this webinar series. There will be one homework assignment due at the end of this training. As stated in the previous slide, you will be able to access the homework assignment from the web page for this training. The homework must be completed via Google Form. The due date is Tuesday, December 1st. A certificate will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by December 1st. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. The prerequisites for this training are creating an account with Google Earth Engine if you want to follow along with the demo, as well as going through the fundamentals of remote sensing. If you are interested in learning more about Google Earth Engine, we recommend exploring the tutorials provided at the link below. The learning objectives for today's training are the following. After participating in this training, you should be able to summarize the characteristics, causes, and impacts of urban heat islands, identify the satellites and sensors used in analyzing urban heat islands, replicate the steps of converting data from the Landsat series of satellites to land surface temperature estimates using Google Earth Engine, and finally, to recognize the limitations of satellite data for urban heat island analysis. Below is a list of abbreviations used throughout today's training for your reference. I will now provide a brief overview of NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. The Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSET, is part of NASA's Applied Sciences Capacity Building Program. RSET empowers the global community through both online and in-person remote sensing training. Thematic areas for trainings include water resources, air quality, disasters, and land. The goal of the RSET program is to increase the use of earth science in decision-making through training for professionals in the public and private sectors, environmental managers, as well as policymakers. All RSET materials are freely available to use and adapt for your curriculum. If you use the methods and data presented in RSET trainings, please acknowledge the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. RSET is now in its 11th year of providing remote sensing training to increase the use of earth science in decision making. Over the past 11 years, RSET has trained over 40,000 participants from over 170 countries and conducted over 140 trainings in air quality, water resources, land, and disasters. The circles in the graph correspond to the number of participants 
attending each RSET training. As shown, the past few years have seen a marked increase in the number of participants following our trainings. We are delighted to offer high quality trainings for specific applications in earth science and hope you would join the RSET listserv to learn, to learn more about upcoming trainings as they are offered. Now for an overview of the characteristics, causes, and impacts of urban heat islands. An urban heat island occurs when a city experiences much warmer temperatures than outlying areas. Difference in temperature has to do with changes in radiative and thermal properties of impervious surfaces, such as heat absorbing buildings and roads. Both rural and urban systems obtain energy from radiative processes gaining energy from the sun and subsequently losing energy back to the atmosphere and space. Natural surfaces are composed of vegetation and moisture trapping soils. These natural surfaces use a relatively large proportion of the absorbed radiation in the evapotranspiration process and release water vapor that contributes to cool the air in their vicinity. In contrast, Impervious surfaces such as buildings and roads are composed of a high percentage of non-reflective and water-resistant construction materials. As a consequence, they tend to absorb a significant proportion of incident radiation, which is released as heat. The spatial distribution between water, soils, vegetation, and impervious surfaces is what accounts for temperature variability within cities. Urban areas where impervious surfaces are highly concentrated and greenery is limited become islands of higher temperatures. Urban heat islands can form under a variety of conditions, including during the day or night, in small or large cities, in suburban areas, in northern or southern climates, and in any season. There are two types of urban heat islands, which I will go into more details in the coming slides. The first is the urban surface urban heat island, which can be observed through satellite remote sensing. The second is atmospheric or air urban heat island. As we see in the diagram on the right, surface temperatures vary more than atmospheric air temperatures during the day but they're generally similar at night. Daytime surface temperatures are depicted as a solid orange line in the graph, and daytime atmospheric temperatures are depicted as a dashed orange line. The dips and spikes in surface temperatures over the pond area show how water maintains a nearly constant temperature day and night because it does not absorb the sun's energy the same way as buildings and paved surfaces. Parks, open land, and bodies of water can create cooler areas within a city. Temperatures are typically lower at suburban rural borders than in downtown areas. Surface urban heat islands represent the radiative temperature difference between impervious and natural surfaces. Surface urban heat islands are present at all times of the day and night, but are most intense during the day when the sun is shining. The magnitude of surface urban heat islands varies with seasons due to changes in the sun's intensity, as well as ground cover and weather. As a result of such variation, surface urban heat islands are typically largest in the summer. Surface urban heat islands are primarily measured through remote sensing, which we'll go into much more detail later in this training. Warmer air in urban areas compared to cooler air in, in rural surroundings defines atmospheric urban heat islands. Atmospheric urban heat islands can be subdivided into canopy layer heat islands and boundary layer heat islands. 
Canopy layer heat islands exist in the layer of air where people live, from the ground to below the tops of trees and roofs. They are measured by in situ sensors mounted on fixed meteorological stations or mobile traverses. Boundary layer heat islands start from the rooftop and treetop level and extend up to the point where urban landscapes no longer influence the atmosphere. This region typically extends to no more than one and a half kilometers from the surface. Boundary layer heat islands are measured by tall towers, radio songs, and aircraft. Canopy layer urban heat islands are the most commonly observed of the two types and are often the ones referred to in discussions of urban heat islands. They are often weak during the late morning and throughout the day and become, and become more pronounced after sunset due to the slow release of heat from urban infrastructure. Now let's turn to the causes of urban heat islands. Properties, as mentioned before, of urban materials, in particular albedo, thermal emissivity, and heat capacity, influence urban heat island development as they determine how the sun's energy is reflected, emitted, and absorbed. Albedo is the percentage of solar energy reflected by a surface. Urban areas typically have surface materials such as asphalt, concrete, and brick, which have a lower albedo than those in rural areas. As a result, urban areas generally reflect less and observe more of the sun's energy. This absorbed heat increases surface temperatures and contributes to the formation of surface and atmospheric urban heat islands. Emissivity is a measure of a surface's ability to shed heat. <clears throat> Surfaces with high emittance values will stay cooler because they will release heat more readily. Another important property that influences heat island development is a material's heat capacity, which refers to its ability to store heat. Many building materials, such as steel, brick, and stone, have higher heat capacities than rural materials, such as dry soil and sand. As a result, Cities are typically more effective at storing the sun's energy as heat within their infrastructure. Another cause of urban heat islands is due to reduced vegetation in urban areas. Trees and vegetation provide shade, which helps lower surface temperatures. They also help reduce air temperatures through evapotranspiration, in which plants release water to the surroundings at, dis uh, at air dissipating ambient heat. In most urban areas, dry impervious surfaces predominate. As cities develop, more vegetation is lost and more surfaces are paved or covered with buildings. The change in ground cover results in less shade and moisture to keep urban areas cool, which contributes to elevated surface and air temperatures. A third cause of urban heat islands is due to anthropogenic heat. Anthropogenic heat contributes to atmospheric heat islands and refers to heat produced by human activities. It can come from a variety of sources and is estimated by totaling all the energy used for heating and cooling, running appliances, transportation, and industrial processes. Anthropogenic heat varies throughout cities, but can significantly contribute to heat island formation. An additional factor that influences urban heat island development, particularly at night, is urban geometry, which refers to the dimensions and spacing of buildings within a city. Urban geometry influences wind flow, energy absorption, and a given surface's ability to emit long wave radiation back to space. Two primary weather characteristics affect urban heat island development, wind and cloud cover. In general, urban heat islands form during periods of calm winds and clear skies because these conditions maximize the amount of solar energy reaching urban surfaces and minimize the amount of heat that can be convected away. Conversely, strong winds and cloud cover 
suppress urban heat islands. Lastly, the geographic location of a city will be impacted by climate and topography. Large bodies of water can moderate temperature, while nearby mountains can block wind or create wind patterns that pass through a city. Now that we've covered the characteristics and causes of urban heat islands, we'll address why urban heat islands are a problem. Increased daytime surface temperatures, reduced nighttime cooling, and higher air pollution levels associated with urban heat islands can affect human health by contributing to general discomfort, respiratory difficulties, heat cramps and exhaustion, non-fatal heat stroke, and heat-related mortality. Children, older adults, and those with existing health conditions are particularly at risk. Elevated summertime temperatures in cities increase energy demand for cooling and add pressure to the electricity grid during peak periods of demand, which generally occur on hot summer weekday afternoons. During extreme heat events, which are exacerbated by urban heat islands, the resulting demand for cooling can overload systems and require a utility to institute controlled rolling brownouts or blackouts to avoid power outages. Higher temperatures can increase energy demand, which generally causes higher levels of air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. Currently, most electricity in the United States is produced from combusting fossil fuels. These pollutants are harmful to human health and contribute to complex air quality problems such as acid rain and contribute to climate change. In addition to increases in air emissions, elevated air temperatures increase the rate of ground level ozone formation, which is produ produced when NOx and volatile organic compounds react in the presence of sunlight. Finally, surface urban heat islands degrade water quality mainly by thermal pollution. Water temperature affects all aspects of aquatic life, especially the metabolism and reproduction of many aquatic species. When warm runoff from impervious surfaces flows into ponds, wetlands, rivers, and lakes, aquatic life can experience stress and shock when water temperatures reach a certain level. As a reminder, Canopy layer heat island is the layer of air from the surface to the tops of the trees and buildings. It is useful in mitigating public health risks since it is the best indicator of conditions experienced by people. It is measured by in-situ sensors on fixed meteorological stations or traverses and by climate models to estimate temperatures in places where no field data are available. Due to limited monitoring stations, measured canopy layer heat islands provide insufficient spatial detail for urban planning. Surface urban heat islands represent the difference of land surface temperature in urban relative to non-urban areas, as well as hotspots within urban areas, and are usually measured using satellite remote sensing. Satellite thermal remote sensing measures surface urban heat islands and provides consistent, objective, timely, and repeatable observations of the Earth's surface. Remote sensing offers the ability to study the urban thermal environment at various spatial scales, from local to global, and also temporal scales, including diurnal, seasonal, and interannual. I will now pass the presentation over to my colleague Amita to tell us about satellites and sensors used in analyzing urban heat islands. Thank you, Sean. So now in this section, uh, we're going to have an overview of satellites and sensors used in analyzing urban heat islands. We will start with a very brief introduction to remote sensing of land surface temperatures or LSTs, which are used for monitoring urban heat islands. We will then look at a list of satellites and sensors which are relevant for estimating LSTs. 
and we will also look at land surface temperature data already derived from some of the satellites and readily available. How to access these data sets is what we are going to look at. Then we will also look at a couple of ancillary data sets which can help in assessing vulnerability and impact of urban heat islands. Finally, we will look at benefits and limitations of satellite measurements for monitoring urban heat islands. So remote sensing of land surface temperatures. Uh, we know that Earth emits radiation in infrared wavelengths and as shown here in the spectrum, it is the thermal infrared uh, channel that is used the most for most commonly for LST estimation and that is between 8 to 15 micrometers. If you look at this schematic diagram, a satellite receives radiation at top of the atmosphere, so it's called TOA radiances, so emitted by Earth's surface, attenuated by atmosphere and then it is received by the satellite. So the TOA radiances uh, which are sensitive to land surface temperature, they are affected also by land surface emissivity because from different surface types uh, radiation is emitted at different rates um, and so if it is bare land or built up area or grass or forest or water, it matters how much radiation will be emitted um, no matter what the temperature is, emissivity is also important. Also, the radiation emitted by the surface gets attenuated by the atmosphere because of water vapor and aerosols. Um, they absorb some of this radiation. Also, the angle at which satellite sensor receives the radiation, intensity of that radiation depends on that also. So in order to derive land surface temperatures, all these factors have to be known. Here, uh, there's a spectrum shown uh, from, and, and the channels marked here are from GOES-R, which is a geostationary satellite. And as you can see, 10, 11, 12, all these are in thermal IR band, up to 15. Um, however, as you can see from here, between 10 and 12 micrometers, atmosphere is relatively um, transparent to infrared radiation. So radiation uh, emitted by the surface which depends on its temperature and emissivity, um, most of it is received by the satellite. So this window is quite popular, generally used for deriving LSTs. There are references given here, which provide details of several methodologies that are used in uh, deriving LSTs from infrared radiation. Sometimes uh, one uh, channel is used, sometimes multiple uh, channels are used, and um, there are also methodologies which derive emissivity and temperature for surface tiles simultaneously. So we recommend that you look at the references for details. There are several polar and geostationary satellites which have been flying with sensors that have thermal infrared uh, bands in them. And so that is what we are going to review next. Uh, so here, the so satellites and sensors, uh, we're estimating LSTs. Satellite sensors and their temporal coverage, they're shown here. To start with, there's Landsat series 4, 5, 7, and 8. All of them had sensors uh, with uh, infrared channels, such as thematic mapper on 4 and 5, ETM plus or enhanced thematic mapper on 7, and thermal infrared sensor or TIRS on Landsat 8. Uh, there is also an um, operational land imager in OLI and there are also other um, channels in these instruments which help in deriving land cover which is uh, really useful in understanding emissivity from the surface. So there are additional sensors as well in addition to these TIR channels. As you can see, Landsat 4 was launched in July 1982, so between 4 and 8 uh, these measurements are available from mid-July all the way to present. Also, there is Landsat 9 plant which will be launched and so these measurements will continue. Two other satellites which are also relatively long-term are Terra and Aqua. They both have a moderate resolution imaging spectral radiometer or MODIS on Terra and Aqua. In addition, 
Terra has advanced space-borne thermal emission and reflection radiometer or ESTER. All, all these instruments, they have thermal IR channels. And as you can see, these data sets span more than 15 years. This is almost 20 years now, uh, 1999, December, and this is April 2002. One of the recent missions, which is called ECOSTRESS or Ecosystem Space-Borne Thermal Radiometer Experiment, uh, on space station. So that is flying on International Space Station. And there is a hyperspectral uh, instrument. It's called Prototype high speed Thermal Infrared Radiometer, or PHI-TIR. Uh, this instrument, um, this was launched in 2018 June, and it has been flying. Okay. There are additional satellites. Uh, so the, these satellites are all NASA satellites. These are um, some sensors are derived, uh, I mean, they are developed by NASA and NOAA, and some of these satellites are from NOAA as well as from European space agencies. But they also have thermal IR bands, and they are used for LST estimation. So SUMI, National Polar Partnership, or NSPP, and Joint Polar Satellite System, these are NOAA satellites. They have visible infrared imaging radiometers, that's VIRS. Uh, it's been flying since October 2011 and continues till present. NOAA operational satellites, the current missions are 15, 18, 19, and 20, which is JPSS. Uh, they have uh, advanced very high resolution radiometer or AVHRR that has a long-term coverage uh, starting from first NOAA operational satellites so in 79 to present, it extends. Also, European space agencies, Meteop A and B, they carry AVHRR as well. Um, NOAA series of geostationary operational environmental satellites, or GOES, um, they, these satellites have been flying one after another since mid-70s. And earlier satellites had imager and sounder in infrared and visible channels, including thermal IR bands. The current satellites go 16 and 17. They have advanced baseline imager um, and this can be, this has been used for deriving LSDs. Finally, European Space Agency has Sentinel 3A and 3B, has sea and land surface temperature radiometer or SLSTR. Uh, this has been flying, uh, there are two satellites in, launched respectively in 2016 February and 18 April. They have been flying since then. Um, also, uh, there is Sentinel-2A and 2B. They have multi-spectral instrument or MSI, relatively high resolution instrument. This does not have thermal IR channels, but this has channels which can be used again for looking at land cover. And so look for land cover, uh, land emissivity, emissivity, this instrument can be used. Just to uh, go over uh, what types of satellites these are. So Landsat series of uh, satellites that are polar orbiting satellites uh, going from pole to pole that the spots are shown here. Uh, the local time of observation is 10 a.m. Uh, p.m. and swath width is 185 kilometers. Uh, Terra and Aqua which carry MODIS, um, they, the MODIS swath is about 23-30 kilometers and the orbits are such that observation time is 10.30 a.m. p.m. for Terra and 1.30 a.m. p.m. for Aqua. Esther is on Terra and has swath width of 60 kilometers, a high resolution uh, instrument this is. Uh, ISS EcoStress, International Space Station EcoStress has uh, swath width varying between 385 to 415 kilometers and has varying temporal samplings depending on how the orbit is. Also, uh, these data are available over the US alone. Uh, SNPP and JPSS VIRS has a very broad swath, 300 km, 3000 kilometers, and the time of observations is 1.30 a.m. p.m. Um, there is no, one thing about VIRS is that there is no gaps between swaths. There's um, continuous coverage uh, as opposed to say Landsat and MODIS where you do see these uh, blank areas between swaths. 
NOAA operational satellites are also polar satellites. They are in two AM, PM orbits, uh, this NOAA 19 particularly. Uh, many of them, they uh, have different time of uh, orbits, but this one is at 2 AM, PM. Swath is 2,900 kilometers. Okay. Now, GOES is the geostationary satellite that we talked about a long time series. Uh, there are two GOES satellites currently in orbit. The one in east over Atlantic is GO-16 and west is um, 17. And as you can see, uh, geostationary satellites, so they have observations of this full disk shown here. So one centered here, one centered here. And because they go around with Earth, so they are constantly looking at this disks. Uh, and their images can be quite frequent. So it could, could be at every 10 minutes or 15 minutes in some cases. Sentinel-3 and Sentinel-2 both are polar orbiting satellites in 10 and 10.30 a.m. p.m. orbits respectively. Um, and SWAT width for SLSTR is 740 kilometers, whereas for MSI is 290 kilometers. So now these are the sensors and what is shown here is their temporal and spatial resolution. Now these slides or information about satellite sensors, you can use them as a reference. So if you are interested in using this data for LSE estimation, you can go back and pick the sensor that is appropriate for you. So Landsat sensors, uh, TM, ETM, PLUS, and TIRS, they all have, as you can see, uh, uh, spectral bands between 10 and 12. Um, and uh, MODIS, same thing. Ester, and this is the um, eco-stress instrument, this is hyperspectral, has multiple bands between 8 and 12. Special resolution for Landsat sensors are uh, ranging from 30 meters to 100 meters. So TMI, TM and ETM plus, they have 120 meters, 60 meters resolution, but they are resampled at 30 meters and TIRS is at 100 meters. The temporal resolution for Landsat is 16 days, so every 16 day you get one image. MODIS has relatively lower resolution, it is one kilometer pixel and uh, it's every 12 hours a.m. p.m. Esther has high resolution it's 90 meter pixel and that also is 12 hourly every twice a daily data. Uh, Ecostress um, Phi TR they also has uh, 60 meter and this covers uh, CONUS only all these sensors have global coverage. VIRS has resolution of 750 meters. Again, it is twice daily. AVHRR, uh, that has also one kilometer and four kilometer. This also uh, actually um, same, uh, twice daily. These are polar orbiting satellites. Um, GOES sounder and this advanced baseline imager, uh, they have two kilometer resolution and uh, they have two, um, different way they look at either just uh, US, continental US, or a full disk image that we just saw. Um, and temporal resolution can be minutes, hours to day, uh, so day and night, so it, that's a continuous observations. And SLSTR is one kilometer, it's also twice daily. Also notice all of them have this thermal IR bands, so they can be used for deriving LSTs. If you are interested in getting uh, TIR radiances, top of atmosphere radiances in these bands, then these are the websites which um, provide these radiances. So for all the satellite sensors that we saw, uh, from Landsat all the way to GOES and Sentinel data, these websites can be visited to get radiance data. What we want to show next is actually ready-made temperature product that uh, you can um, get from some of these websites. So before we do that though, um, there are two uh, websites that we want to point out. This is NASA Earth Data and then this is USGS Earth Explorer and websites are given here. Um, and um, so all the NASA satellite data 
that you, you want to search for, they can be found through Earth data and or a USGS Earth Explorer. Any data that you are looking for can be found from here um, or LSD related data can be found in USGS Earth Explorer also. This is just for your information. With that, we will start with lens surface temperature data products. Okay. So Lensat has already a Lensat lens surface temperature uh, data product. The website is given here with a lot of information. There is a product guide here. This is a provisional product, as you can see here, based on Lensat 4 and 8 um, TIR bands. And uh, this is only on the over the US. They are derived over the US only right now, 1982 to present. And it also, it uses lens surface emissivity from ester uh, and also NDVI data are used. So these are normalized difference vegetation index. This tells you uh, what kind of surface it is, whether it's bare surface or there is vegetation. Atmospheric profiles for atmospheric correction is used also. And um, uh, these data are available at 30 meter resolution. So these are uh, quite useful for looking at um, urban heat islands and can be obtained from Earth Explorer. Uh, several of uh, our set webinars have covered Earth Explorer, uh, US US Earth Explorer site. Um, and um, so basically you can pick data set, spatial domain, uh, and temporal domain also, a temporal uh, range also. Here, I've just picked Washington DC for example. And once you pick the data, uh, which satellite you want and dates you pick, you can get a number of images that um, you can download. So you search for data as Landsat ARD data and you get a number of parameters. One of them is this provisional lens surface temperature data that you can select that, you can click and download. There is also bulk download available from this site. And you can save this data as stiff image and eventually you can analyze this in GIS as is it shown here over DC. This is uh, 22nd August 2019 and it shows land surface temperature variations um, over the city uh, in Washington DC. Also notice that uh, when you look at the data, there are sometimes scale factors uh, associated with it. And this information is available from metadata along with the images that you can use to scale the data. That's something to keep in mind for all the data sets to, you use. Next, it's the MODIS land surface data. These are also derived products and um, these are physically based algorithms. Um, you can look at this website for references, um, also the methodology, how it's derived. Um, since MODIS is a multi-spectral band instrument, it also is used for um, deriving both LST and emissivity simultaneously. Resolution is one kilometer. And again, uh, based on the ester temperature emissivity separation algorithm, uh, which is described here that is used. Uh, the coverage is global uh, since 2000. And there are multiple products. So these are from Aqua, Terra, and these are from Aqua. So MOD is Terra and MYD is Aqua. So you have Lancet, uh, land surface temperature and emissivity um, daily five minute swath. You can have um, daily global one kilometer, so during daytime and nighttime because they are twice available. And then this is eight daily uh, data. So these data are available already. And um, they, the, so we are going to see how to get that. Uh, but Veers also has similar products. Uh, which uh, can extend this MODIS time series. Uh, so VIRS, length of its temperature and emissivity are synergic, synergistic with MODIS data products. And similar algorithm, um, is, algorithm approach are used to derive these data. 
Uh, only difference is that here this swath has 750 meter resolution. Everything else is one kilometer. Again, you have day, night, and eight day images from VIRS as well. Echo stress land surface data. Um, these are uh, available only on the contraminous US um, and then they are um, key for understanding biomes and agricultural zones. That's the objective of EcoStress. And that's why um, uh, atmospherically corrected lens of its temperature emissivity values are derived from uh, this instrument or this mission. Um, this is the product name. Uh, it's available uh, here. The resolution is 70 meter, as you can see here. Uh, it's available since July 2018. The temporal resolution kind of varies depending on when uh, International Space Station is going over a particular region. Now all MODIS, VIRS and EcoStress um, temperature data, lens surface temperature data can be obtained by this site. It's USGS appears and this RSET webinar describes um, how, how to use APPEARS. There are details provided in here, but basically there is a way to pick each of these data, uh, MODIS, VIRS, and ECOSTRES. You can search as land surface temperature here, and you will see the list of all the products. So this is a product search. Um, you can have temporal subsetting, and you can pick a special domain by drawing a polygon here or you can upload your own shape file to get data and different project uh, different formats and projection are also available through here it's a very uh, useful site to get all these land surface data okay finally ester land surface data that is um, available uh, from um, the information is available here and the product IDs, so both lens surface temperature and emissivity are available. So these are the product IDs. You would search with that if you like. Um, it's available since March 2000 at resolution of 90 meter. So if you look at the resolutions, Landsat is 30 meters, um, Ester is 90 meters, EcoStress is 70 meters. So these are higher resolution sensors. And the other sensors like MODIS, VIRS, um, they have one kilometer resolution. Ester data can be accessed by this from this NASA Earth data. Uh, and uh, there is a special subsetting and temporal selection also. So going through this portal, you can extract data and download. You can search product by name and uh, you will be able to download the data. So these are all the NASA data. Now we're looking at uh, NOAA operational geostationary data. So GOES um, land surface temperatures are available from GOES 16 and 17. The ready-made products available from these satellite, two satellites. Um, they are available at 10 kilometer resolution if you look at the full disk or two kilometer resolution over the conus. And um, so there is a NOAA class site which provides this data. Uh, here you can see um, how you can, this is the, the site shown here, where you can enter latitude longitude of your area of interest uh, and you can pick temporal sub, uh, selection subsetting also and this is land surface temperature uh, from product type. For conus or uh, full disk, uh, you can pick one of these. And so then you can download these data either from go 16 or 17. Again, all the satellite and sensors we mentioned, radiances are available for all of them, but the products are available uh, from, the, from Lenset, from Terra and Aqua Modis, Terra Ester, EcoStress, uh, Sum, uh, SNPP and JPSS VIRS and GOES. Okay, now so these are all the land surface data sets we saw. A couple of ancillary data products that we want to mention here, which can be very useful in looking at vulnerability and impact of uh, urban heat islands. One such data set is population data set. 
So this uh, site, CDAC, a socioeconomic data and application center, has multiple data which can be used for uh, looking at vulnerability. So these are socioeconomic data and population data are available um, for several years. Um, and uh, as you can see, um, this also has a way of, you can download GeoTIFF images, you can subset uh, this specially also um, and uh, there are also other useful data sets such as global human built up and settlement extent area from the same site and there are global grid of um, probabilities of urban expansion to 2030 and so these are available if when you are looking at uh, your, uh, urban heat islands. Uh, United States Census Bureau has the uh, socioeconomic data and they're classified in many ways. So population data, you can see this is percent population about the age of 65 years, which would be uh, more vulnerable to um, extreme heat. And similarly, you have multiple way of stratifying population. So this site can be used to get population data. Uh, such global data set is also available from United Nations World Population Dashboard. Um, and again, here is the website. Uh, you can again look at data set by age, by gender, uh, by education level. So these are global data sets that you can use. So with that, um, this is the last part of this section. Um, the limitations already shown ha has mentioned uh, some of those um, are, are, are again shown here is that uh, data acquisition times of sun synchronous satellites or polar orbiting satellites they don't coincide with the uh, time of day when heat index could be or length of its temperature could be maximum or minimum um, and um, resolution also uh, can be a limiting factors for cities lens set um, that only has like daytime data of course because it's um, that's the only time it's available others have twice daily um, these are optical sensors so they cannot see through clouds so if it's very cloudy then you cannot see the surface and again, uh, atmospheric correction and surface emissivity have to be known. Uh, angle at which the radiances are received, that has to be uh, looked at too. Um, and it is difficult to obtain high spectral spatial temporal resolution with the same instrument. So that, um, but one can use multiple instruments as we see and, and do combination to get sense of how lens surface temperature and urban heat island effect is changing. So these are different types of data with different resolutions and sizes and formats. So there's a little bit of um, um, effort involved in getting all the data set for, um, in the same format in your own region of interest. But at the same time, there are several benefits to using remote sensing data for urban heat islands. First of all, it provides continuous spatial coverage compared to in-situ data. Um, and it provides where there is no, there are no systematic in-situ measurements available, they can be used. But if they are available, they can augment the data sets as we will see in, in our uh, subsequent uh, sessions next week and week after. Um, there are uh, simultaneous observations of uh, lens surface temperature, emissivity, and land cover. They are available from uh, these sensors uh, that we saw. Um, many of them provide global consistent data coverage, uh, such as Landsat, um, MODIS, WEARS, AVHRR. These are all um, len uh, global data. Um, these are all open source data, and as we pointed out, uh, there are so many websites and resources that can be used to access these data sets. So with that, uh, we're going to end this section and I'm going to hand it over back to uh, Sean. He is going to show us uh, the engine, how to use that to get uh, lens surface temperature from lens set observations. Thank you.
Thanks, Amita. I will now demonstrate how to convert thermal infrared data from the Landsat series of satellites to land surface temperature estimates using an open source Google Earth Engine code repository. The reason we are using Google Earth Engine for this demo is because it's an online platform created to allow remote sensing users to perform big data analyses in the cloud without having to download data onto your machine. High spatial resolution land surface temperature data sets are currently not available in Earth Engine. We'll be using an open source code repository accessed from Ermita et al. 2020 that allows computing land surface temperatures from Landsat 4, 5, 7, and 8 with all the Google Earth Engine scripts necessary to compute land surface temperature. Google Earth Engine is a cloud-based geospatial processing platform. It is freely available to scientists, researchers, and developers for analysis of the Earth. The platform harnesses Google's computational power through a JavaScript API. Earth Engine contains catalogs of satellite imagery, modeled products, and geospatial datasets for planetary scale analyses of uh, Earth science data. You can access and search the catalog from the link provided on this slide. You can also sign up for a free account if you wish to follow along with this demo or repeat the steps to derive land surface temperature from Landsat imagery on your own time. The image on the slide shows the web-based Integrated Development Environment, or IDE, for the Earth Engine JavaScript API. Code editor features are designed to make developing complex geospatial workflows fast and easy. The JavaScript code editor is where you add or create your own code to take advantage of the Earth Engine API. The map display is for visualizing geospatial datasets and results from running the code from the code editor. The script manager stores private, shared, and example scripts in Git repositories hosted by Google. This is where the repository for calculating land surface temperature is located once you've accessed it from Sophia Ermita's repo. There's an, also an asset manager to upload and manage your own assets in Earth Engine. We encourage you to explore more on your own time to learn more about this cloud-based geospatial processing platform. We've provided a couple links below to the developer's guide, as well as the Google Earth Engine developers group. The processing chain for generating Landsat land surface temperature was fully coded in JavaScript by Armida et al. 2020 using the code editor platform. The open source repository with all associated modules can be accessed at one of the links below. To learn more about how the algorithm was developed, as well as the station data used for validation and the results of the validation exercises, please refer to the reference in the blue box by Armida et al. 2020. The code computes land surface temperature from the thematic mapper instrument on Landsats 4 and 5, enhanced thematic mapper plus on Landsat 7, and the operational land imager and thermal infrared sensor on Landsat 8. Landsat surface temperature is computed using the statistical mono window algorithm developed by the Climate Monitoring Satellite Application Facility, known by the acronym CMSAF. The Climate Monitoring Satellite Application Facility first developed the statistical mono window algorithm to derive land surface temperature data from Meteosat first and second generation satellites. The Meteosat series of satellites are geostationary meteorological satellites operated by UMETSAT. The approach is based on an empirical relationship between top of atmosphere brightness temperatures in a single thermal infrared channel and land surface temperature and utilizes simple linear regression. All inputs to the land surface temperature algorithm are obtained from the Google Earth Engine catalog. They are top of atmosphere brightness temperatures for Landsat's thermal infrared channels and surface reflectance data as provided by the United States Geological Survey. Total column water vapor as provided by the National Center for Envi Environmental Prediction 
and at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and surface and acidity from the Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emission and Reflection Radiometer Global Emissivity Database. This is provided by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This slide lists the Landsat satellites with instruments, bands, bands used in the processing chain to derive land surface temperature, spectral resolutions for each band, naming conventions for the dataset in Earth Engine, the spatial resolution of each band, the equatorial crossing time for each satellite, as well as the date range for each satellite mission. Assuming you've signed up for a Google Earth Engine account, you can launch the application and click on the link below to add the repository from Ermita et al. You will be able to find the added repository under the Scripts tab on the left side of your window. Confirm the repository and all associated modules have been added to your Scripps Manager before proceeding. Within the repo, there are 10 modules written in JavaScript used in the processing chain for calculating land surface temperature from Landsat imagery. There are also two examples for calculating land surface temperature for an area of interest and deriving a time series of land surface temperature for a given location based on user input. The modules used in the processing chain for calculating land surface temperature are as follows. Code to derive bare ground emissivity from Aster data, a module with code that calculates land surface temperature from Landsat data, code that matches the percentage of atmospheric water data to each Landsat image, coefficients used in the statistical model window algorithm determined from linear regressions of radiative transfer simulations performed for 10 classes of total column water vapor. A module with code that applies the statistical window win uh, model window algorithm for computing land surface temperature. Code that computes broadband emissivity from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory's Aster Global Emissivity Database. Code that masks clouds and cloud shadows using the quality band from Landsat data. A module with code that computes the fraction of vegetation cover from NDVI data from Landsat imagery. Code that computes NDVI from Landsat surface reflectance data. And a module of code that computes surface emissivity for Landsat data. The two examples provided by Ermita et al. in the repository show how to compute Landsat's land, Landsat land surface temperature from Landsat 8 imagery over Coimbra, Portugal. The example code can be modified to compute land surface temperature for your own area of interest and from different Landsat imagery. The second example derives a time series of Landsat surface temperature, uh, land surface temperature at a surface radiation budget site in Desert Rock, Nevada. This code can also be easily modified to derive a time series of land surface temperature for your own area of interest. To modify the example code to compute land surface temperature for your area of interest, you will need to specify the following inputs in example one. You will need the longitude and latitude to create a bounding box around your area of interest. You will need to specify which Landsat satellite based on the satellite ID coded into the module. You'll need a start and end date for the Landsat collection chosen, and whether or not to use NDVI values to obtain a dynamic emissivity. If you choose not to use NDI from the Landsat imagery, emissivity is obtained directly from the Aster Global Emissivity Database. Now let's take a look at the code within Earth Engine itself. Assuming you've successfully accessed the repository from Ar Armida, you should be able to find that on the left-hand side of your window within the Scripps Manager. You can see that there are uh, privately owned scripts, publicly owned scripts, and then those that have been shared with you. So in this case, if you look at the reader dropdown, and if you go in there, you should be able to find the repository that you just accessed 
from Sophia Ermita, and as well as the, the 10 modules that are part of that repository, as well as the two uh, example scripts used. I recommend that you go through each of these 10 modules to, to see how they're coded and so you can better understand how the processing chain works. For sake of time, we will skip to the example code written in JavaScript and break this down so you can understand how to run this on your own. For the example one, if we go down to the first variable defined, which is a uh, variable, the Landsat LST, this is defined that calls the Landsat land surface temperature module in the repository for use in the script. If we go a little bit further, we can see that there are five other defined variables here. <clears throat> the inputs I mentioned in the previous slide are those that are, that are entered here. The variable geometry is defined from an earth engine object based on longitude and latitude. The first set of longitude and latitude is for the lower left corner of your bounding box. And the second set of longitude and latitude is for the upper right corner of the bounding box, which forms the rectangle for your area of interest. The next input defines the variable satellite, specifying the Landsat satellite from the ID coded in the module Landsat underscore LST. This module again is being called from the first variable we, we defined in the script. The next variables are defined for the start and end dates for the Landsat collection of choice. The last input defines the variable use underscore NDVI, which specifies whether to use dynamic NDVI from Landsat imagery. In this example, it is true. <clears throat> Scrolling down in the code, a variable is defined named Landsat Cole that calls the script we defined in our first variable and outputs the results from running the land surface temperature script. Outputs include fraction of vegetation cover, land surface temperature, surface emissivity for the thermal infrared band, total column water vapor, and the Landsat original bands that have all been cloud masked. It uses as parameters the inputs we specified above for geometry, satellite, and date range. There's also a print statement below used to inspect the metadata for the printed collections in the console. And the console is found on the right-hand side of the screen uh, in between the inspector and tasks tabs. The next variable defined, x image, takes the first and best cloud-free image from the date range that we specified through the user inputs. The next two variables defined are for the palettes used when visualizing the results in the map window. The next line of code centers the map window on the bounding box we defined by specifying the longitude and the latitude above. Subsequent lines of code added the results from running the land surface temperature module to the map window. Parameters uh, for min and max values are specified along with the palette used and a name of each result found in the, in the layers panel. This last chunk of code here, which I just highlighted, can be uncommented to output the land surface temperature results to your Google Drive. I will uncomment them. Uh, they start with an asterisk and a forward slash for both the beginning and the ending for the comment. So I've, since I've cleared that, I can now export the image. In this case, we're specifying the LST, the land surface temperature, but we could easily specify a different output to be, up, uh, to be downloaded to our Google Drive. But in this case, since I'm interested in land surface temperature, we will leave this as the default. I'll go ahead and click Run at the top of the screen, which will run the code. And momentarily, we'll start seeing results appear in our map display. All the outputs are displayed in the map window. And once they've uh, finished generating themselves, we can click on the Layers pane, and we can see all the different results that have been outputted to the map window. In the Layers panel, we see the True Color Landsat image specified as RGB. 
we have the land surface temperature output from the, uh, from the uh, uh, Landsat. We have the thermal infrared brightness temperature. We have surface emissivity for the thermal infrared band. We have fraction of vegetated cover. And this is, I'm sorry, this is scaled, fraction of vegetated cover scaled from zero to one, similar to NDVI. And then also uh, total column water vapor in millimeters. In this case, I'm gonna leave just the land surface temperature uh, selected because that's what I'm most interested in. We can also go up here to the inspector tab and click on that. And then once that's selected, we can zoom into an area that we find of interest. So let's go to this agricultural area here and we can click on that left click and then we can see the results within the inspector tab. <clears throat> we can also click on the console tab and what this does is we can drill down into the metadata for uh, the Landsat collection that we are using in this analysis. But if we go back to the inspector tab, we can see the total column water vapor uh, in millimeters. We can also see the fraction of vegetated cover in this very unvegetated surface because it's just been cleared uh, prior to planting for, uh, for agricultural practices. We can see the emissivity, which is scaled from zero to one. We also have the thermal infrared brightness temperature, and uh, we also have the uh, land surface temperature, which is shown in Kelvin. So we can click around in different areas of the map, and again, for that given pixel that we selected, it will uh, regenerate new results within the inspector tab. We can also click on the tasks and we can see here because I uncommented the code to export the image to my drive, we can see that uh, it has now been uh, put within my tasks and if I click run, I can then export this to my Google Drive. Uh, in this case, it would be for the land surface temperature. So a lot of functionality uh, in, in some very few lines of code. So what if you wanted to change the study area to your own area of interest for calculating land surface temperature? Well, to do so, we would go back to where we add our own inputs. And for geometry, we're going to have to change that geometry to fit your own longitude and latitude for your study area. So in this case, I'm going to add a study area, which is uh, bounding box around Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States. And for the Landsat satellite, I'm going to leave it as L8, which is for Landsat 8. And then for the start date, I'm going to add July 1st, because I'm interested in temperatures uh, for this for this month, so it's going to be July 1st to July 31st, 2018, and it will select the first best cloud-free image within that month date range, and I'm going to leave the defaults the rest as they are, and I'll go ahead and click Run. The output centers the map window around the bounding box and calculates land surface temperature for the first date in that date range. And again, I specified July of 2018. I'll turn off all the layers except for the land surface temperature layer so that we can see, um, see this image more clearly. And I'll also get more uh, real estate on the map by dragging the uh, script manager up so I can get more of the, um, the map window. And also what I wanna do is I want to change, right now we're on map view, I want to change this to satellite view and I'm going to remove the layers. That way we have a good base map underneath the land surface temperature. So to find, uh, I know where it is, but maybe you don't. This is the city of Baltimore. This is the, Ch uh, the um, Chesapeake Bay, uh, Baltimore. And then this is the I-95 corridor that connects uh, Baltimore to Washington, DC. And so if I turn back on the land surface temperature, we can see areas that are highlighted in different colors reflecting the temperature in Kelvin. 
what we can do is we can also play around with the transparency so we can see uh, see where those impervious and non-impervious surfaces are located within this, this map area. So if I turn uh, the transparency off, we can see areas around waterways and forested areas displayed in cyan and green, and areas of higher land surface temperature in built-up areas visualized in yellow and red. These colors were specified by the palette defined in the code. And again, land surface temperature uh, is in Kelvin. So I'll zoom around to an area in the Navy Yard. And for those that don't know where that is, uh, it's just up on the Potomac River, close to um, uh, in, what is it, uh, southwest, uh, southeast DC. So if we zoom into this area, we can see that there's one, it's along the Anacostia River, which is cooler temperature shown in Cyan. And then we also have some higher temperatures around the Navy Yard, as well as the, um, some of these more built up areas. We can see darker surfaces with lower albedo. And we can also see uh, lighter surfaces. Um, what's interesting is if we look at the Nationals Park, where the professional baseball uh, team plays, which is located right here, we can see that on the field itself, there are uh, low land surface temperature, but then all the built up area around it obviously shows higher land surface temperature. We can use the inspector tab to find pixel values for each layer at a given location. So what we'll do is we'll go up to the inspector tab and then we can click on some of the, uh, the layers here, say in this very built up area here, and then we can actually see all the results that are generated uh, underneath the inspector tab. If you uncommented the code to export an image to your Google Drive, you will find the image waiting uh, to export under the tasks tab. So because I had that unchecked, I, again, I have that I can export this land surface temperature, temp uh, temperature image to my drive to be able to pull into a GIS and to do some more visualization and analyses. So the second example uh, of code drives a time series of land surface temperature. This code can be easily modified to drive a time series of land surface temperature for your own area of interest. I will not be demoing this today uh, just because we're running out of time, but I do encourage you to do so on your own. So some of the ways to get involved in studying urban heat islands through citizen science uh, is through the GLOBE program. The Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment program is an international science and education program that provides students and the public worldwide with the opportunity to participate in data collection and the scientific process. They currently have an urban heat island data collection campaign. Students can set up uh, research studies at their schools, such as looking at the difference between paved and unpaved areas, elevation, latitude and longitude, urban versus rural, proximity to water, et cetera, to better understand the urban, high, urban heat island effect in their community. Some of the data you will be collecting in this campaign are cloud data, surface temperature, and air temperature. All super exciting. The first link takes you to more information about this urban heat island uh, citizen science campaign. And the second link makes you familiar with the atmosphere protocols followed by GLOBE when they collect data for their scientific investigations. You will explore the steps of setting up a GLOBE atmosphere uh, study site and be introduced to GLOBE data reporting and visualization tools. We hope you'll explore both websites to learn how you can participate in data collection and the scientific process to better understand urban heat islands. For educators, My NASA Data provides grades 3 through 12 teachers access to NASA mission data through unique tools that help students learn about Earth system science. The project's value is providing earth science data resources that are teacher and student friendly. The links below will take you to lessons you can complete with your students and for creating a story map 
with your students to interact with NASA images, charts, and graphs for your students to explore urban heat island effect using land surface temperature and vegetation data. Below are references we provided for further research. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of this training. We've been receiving many questions throughout this presentation and we will try and answer them in the order received based on the time we have remaining. If you haven't already, please enter your questions into the question and answer box. For the questions we don't have time to address today, we will answer them and post the Q&A doc to the training website following the conclusion of the course. Below is the contact information for both Amita and myself, along with the training page to access materials going forward. We will now start the question and answer session. Starting off with the first question that we have uh, for the question and answer session. Uh, the question was, uh, does the building material matter in urban heat islands or is it negligible? And the answer that we have put is, uh, well, the properties of urban materials, uh, in particular albedo, thermal emissivity, and heat capacity, all influence urban heat island development as they determine how the sun's energy is reflected, emitted, and absorbed. So building materials, uh, i.e. in urban areas, generally reflect less and absorb more of the sun's energy. This absorbed heat increases the surface temperature and contributes to the formation of surface and atmospheric urban heat islands. So um, it is not negligible, definitely not. Uh, question two, how can urban heat island research actually change urban planning for well-established urban areas? Uh, they used some examples from the United States, New York City, Chicago, et cetera. These are all large cities uh, that have established infrastructure uh, that has been in place, buildings built up, uh, roads, buildings, et cetera. So the answer is uh, doing research in urban heat islands uh, and understanding uh, you know, spatially and the, uh, the dynamics throughout the city help city planners by understanding, for example, where to increase tree and vegetative cover uh, so through uh, remote sensing, and we're going to be hearing a lot more about this uh, next week when we hear more about uh, uh, Dr. Vivek Chandas' uh, work with using in-situ data in urban areas, where well, they can identify what areas are uh, the tree cover or vegetation cover is lower, and that can determine where best to plan for maybe efforts to, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, to replant, to, to provide more cooling and evapotranspiration in these hotspots of the area. Uh, it can also show uh, uh, maybe plan on where to install green roofs. Uh, green roofs uh, are, are much better at cooling uh, the built up areas within the cities, as well as installing if uh, it, uh, roofing with higher albedo, so more reflective roofing, so they're not absorbing uh, as much as the, the sun's energy, as well as uh, using cool pavements, uh, reflective uh, permeable, et cetera. And then uh, all this on how to utilize better smart growth practices. So. If you're a city that uh, might be going uh, under a lot of change and development, you can use the resources, especially uh, the, the resources that we've talked about today for better planning on as the city is growing and, and how best to uh, develop that city. So taken together, these actions can all contribute to lowering overall urban heat island within hotspots of urban areas, as well as pr provide greater benefits uh, to the residents that are, are living. Uh, in these areas that are already well established, like New York City, Chicago, et cetera. Uh, question three, uh, can we analyze the urban heat island? Uh, and I guess this case, yeah, the, uh, this, this um, participant was interested in using a GIS, either ArcGIS or QGIS. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so the land surface temperature products, uh, which uh, uh, Dr. Amita Mekta described today, uh, can be acquired from the websites that were all referenced in today's training. And once you are able to download them, you can certainly bring them into a, a GIS uh, if you have access to ArcGIS or QGIS, which is uh, an open source uh, GIS software. You can certainly bring them into that for further analysis if it's identifying uh, time series trends or, or just identifying hotspots within that area. So that, that is certainly uh, all possible um, to do within, within a GIS. Uh, question number four. How does one identify the impact of the urban heat island effect on seaside megacities 
uh, like Chennai and Mumbai of India with comparison to other inland megacities uh, like, like Delhi uh, or Kolkata. Um, so this is tricky because urban heel islands are, are highly localized for many of the reasons we talked about today. Um, different cities located in different ge geographical areas have different climates associated with them, different built up environments. Um, so all of these, so despite the fundamental physics uh, behind them being similar, uh, they're uh, strongly modulated by local dynamics. So it's best to identify the impacts uh, of the urban, highland, urban heat islands on cities individually. Uh, and that's probably the best uh, course of action for uh, this participant. Question five, uh, land, land, sat, land surface temperature. When you say over the United States, is it only the continental United States? Does it include US territories? So uh, currently the product that the analysis ready product that the USGS provides, uh, this land surface temperature product uh, is currently only available for the conterminous United States, uh, Alaska and Hawaii. So that does not include US territories. That being said, if you if you ingest, if you use the code that we provided uh, with the uh, you know open source repository, um, you will be able to generate that land surface temperature over uh, US territories. Uh, but you will not be able to do it from the analysis uh, ready data that is provided by USGS, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to do this training and provide this code to you in Google Earth Engine so you can do this analysis uh, regardless of, of where you live, as long as you have good coverage from uh, the Landsat missions for the specific date range that you're interested in. Uh, question six, are there future plans to generate Landsat land surface temperature data for areas other than the conterminous United States? If so, is there a tentative date? Uh, the short answer is yes. The USGS does have plans to generate a, a land surface temperature product uh, for areas outside of the United States, but currently it has not been uh, released. Uh, it's because all of the validation exercises they've been doing have all within, uh, within the United States currently. Uh, the methodology we showed today uh, using the open source code on Google Earth Engine does allow you to generate land surface temperature for any area, you know, outside, inside the United States, uh, as long as the Landsat has coverage of that area. Uh, what I will recommend this participant that asked this question is to please join us for all three parts of this webinar series. Um, because in the, in the third part of this webinar series, we will be joined by a colleague uh, from the USGS Aero Center, uh, who's actually working on these algorithms uh, for land surface temperature within the United States. And he is a, a, a wonderful person to direct this question to. So please uh, do join us for the third part of this, this webinar series. And, and please ask the question again, so you can get it directly from the source of these people that from USGS that are, are uh, making this analysis ready data available to, to the public. Uh, so question seven, with the use of MODIS land surface temperature data, certain rural areas are much hotter than the urban area in certain cities during the day, and urban areas get hotter comparatively in the night. What could be the cause? So again, we'll mention that urban heat islands are highly localized. So there might be areas within these rural areas with a high level of built up services. Uh, this could be, uh, you know, industrial areas or, or just, um, you know, just some type of a built up uh, area outside of that core downtown area. So this could be one of the reasons why, just in terms of spatial variability, um, uh, this could be the cause as well as there's also a lot of cities that are built up in arid environments. Um, so they actually do a lot of landscaping within uh, urban areas for uh, you know, uh, uh, urban forests, urban tree cover, et cetera. And if you're in an arid environment where you don't have a lot of vegetation outside of the, the downtown area, then this, these, um, the planning that the cities take to, to vegetate the, the urban areas can actually cool it relative than the outlying areas. So that might be one of the reasons as well. Uh, again, everything is highly localized, so it really just depends on what city that your, uh, your study area or area of interest might be. And then regarding urban uh, areas being hotter comparatively at nighttime, again, that was uh, what we discussed earlier. Uh, so it has to do with a lot of the building materials, uh, such as you know, uh, steel, stone, 
uh, etc., uh, uh, have higher heat capacities than rural materials. They also have lower albedos, so they reflect uh, less than, than rural areas. So, uh, for example, such as uh, dry soil and sand. So, as a result, uh, again, cities are typically uh, more effective at storing the sun's energy, especially during the day, and then they re-radiate that, or they radiate it at night, uh, which, again, is warming that city comparatively at nighttime. Uh, question number eight, will the codes be provided for use in Google Earth Engine at the end of the webinar? Uh, the answer is if you go on the, the training page uh, for this specific training, uh, Satellite Remote Sensing for Urban Heat Islands, and if you go to the, the, the slides that we provide for today's training, um, you have the links to those open uh, source uh, repositories that have the code written in JavaScript for everything that was covered today. So we highly recommend you please go to the RSET training page. I think we'll put a link on here momentarily. And we've also provided a link below in one of the lower questions. So please go to that, uh, click on that link, uh, access the slides from today's training, and you'll be able to click and access the all the code that we showcased during today's training. Question nine, can I use urban heat island data for sustainable urban planning in favor of reducing temperature in a city? Uh, so the short answer is yes. And we'll allude to the a question that we, we answered earlier, uh, which is land service temperature products uh, can be used for urban planning to understand, you know, where are areas within a city uh, you know, is it, is it, uh, you know, how heterogeneous is a city? Are there areas that are, are lacking uh, in, say, tree cover? And can we see a correlation between that tree cover and higher land surface temperatures? And if so, that can maybe uh, uh, better direct city planners, urban planners, on where they should be going and, and planning for greater urban uh, tree canopy cover. Uh, it also helps inform where to install green roofs within the buildings, uh, within urban areas. Uh, some areas might be hot spots, even within uh, uh, the urban town. Yeah, there might be hot spots within those downtown areas, and it can better inform on on where to plant, uh, you know, green roofs, uh, install uh, install more uh, reflective roofing, uh, so you're not trapping as much as the the sun's radiation. As also, uh, you, uh, where to maybe put in or or install uh, cool pavements that are um, more reflective or uh, permeable as well. And question 10, is there consistent land surface temperature data starting from the 1980s uh, just for trend analysis? And I believe Amita answered this one, but you can derive land surface temperature since 1980 using uh, AVHRR or GOES. Uh, those are two different um, instruments on NOAA uh, satellites. And then also Landsat land surface temperature are, are available from mid-1982, starting with the Landsat 4 mission uh, until the present, and they can be used to identify the trends. So you have different options there, depending on how far back in time you want to go. Uh, definitely land Landsat land surface temperature will provide the highest spatial resolution. So if you're trying to really drill down within an urban area, that's, that's certainly going to be uh, the most precise in terms of identifying hotspots. But again, all of these are, are available to you, and, and some of them go back uh, for four decades. So question 11. While deciding which satellite to use to retrieve data for urban heat islands, is it better to use something like MODIS, since it has land surface temperature and emissiv emissivity simultaneously, yet the resolution is better in Landsat? Uh, again, Landsat uh, spatial resolution being 30 meters. And the answer to this is, uh, for looking at spatial, uh, 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 for looking at spatial resolution, land surface temperature patterns within urban areas, Landsat is better because of the higher spatial resolution. MODIS data can provide area integrated continuous time series of Landsat learned surface temperature. So for looking at frequent land surface temperature variations, MODIS is better due to its temporal resolution. Um, so this is uh, either eight, uh, it can be a daily product. Uh, there's MODIS also as an eight day product, et cetera. So if you're really trying to look at, uh, you know, uh, within uh, say a month and then the changes within that month or, uh, you know, um, diurnally, then that might be the better option of the two. So question 12, which season and data should be considered best uh, to study urban heat island effects and also are the outputs of all the available data sets the same or different? Uh, so answer 12, uh, usually summer season data are considered for looking at urban heat island effect. Uh, when This is when land surface temperatures are maximum. 
but all seasons will show indications of urban areas uh, being warmer than their surrounding non-urban uh, open areas. So it's going to be most pronounced during the summer months. Uh, that would be either uh, the austral summer or the northern latitude northern summer. But uh, again, you can study this effect uh, throughout the year uh, at seasonally or annually. Question 13, <clears throat> what are appropriate atmospheric correction algorithms to apply to Landsat thermal infrared data to compute land surface temperature? Are these already processed? So yes, Landsat land surface temperature are already processed <clears throat> as we saw in the presentation and are available from the USGS Earth Explorer, uh, but these are only for the United States. Uh, what I am showing in Google Earth Engine can be used to derive land surface temperature from Landsat. Uh, it really depends. The, the uh, atmospheric corrections for Landsat 8 are going to be a different correction that are applied from Landsat 4 through 7. And uh, we will put the, uh, the exact names of those uh, the algorithms that they use to correct them, but they're derived from, uh, from the USGS. And we will certainly put them in there uh, before we post this uh, question and answer document to, uh, to the RCET website. So question 14. Do you know any good tutorials or courses on how to use Google Earth Engine with Python? instead of JavaScript. Um, so I'm familiar with using JavaScript, but there are certainly a lot of uh, tutorials that are out there on YouTube uh, or online that you can do to search uh, that you can maybe receive some training or, or, or more information on how to use Python. I highly encourage you to do that if that is your, uh, the language that you're most familiar or comfortable using. So we're gonna do this one last question uh, because there's so many more questions to get to, but what we can do is uh, we're gonna answer the rest of these uh, for all of them that were, were added, uh, and we will post the rest of these to our uh, the training page. So please, at the conclusion of this, uh, this, this, uh, this three-part webinar series, please go to the R-Site website where we will post all of the Q&A uh, docs for all three of the their three parts. But again, we're gonna end it with this one just because we are running over for time. But for question 15, uh, uh, can the CMSAF uh, uh, SMW algorithm be used for any of the satellite data, for example, Astro data or EcoStress? So the answer is land surface temperature data are available from Astro and EcoStress, as we just saw. Uh, the CMSAF algorithm is used with Landsat data. Um, it's also used with Meteosat data. Uh, and you, can tr you, you may try to apply it with Astro EcoStress um, with appropriate modifications to the algorithm. Um, but Aster does use its own uh, surface emissivity that has been calculated uh, in a date, I believe it's from 2000 to 2008. Um, and so they actually use their own algorithms to derive land surface temperature, which are, uh, uh, and actually it's used, they're the same, some of the similar coefficients and algorithms are used to generate the Landsat land surface temperature, um, but they are, they are different. So, um, so anyway, we hopefully we answered that and we will certainly get to all the rest of the questions that you had and we will answer them all and post them to the webpage. Um, but we are running over, so I, I just wanna thank, uh, I wanna thank Dr. Amita Mekta for uh, presenting today. We also wanna present, uh, uh, thank our wonderful team, uh, Brock Blevins, uh, Selwyn hudson Odoy, as well as uh, Jonathan O'Brien, who have all been in the background, making sure that this, uh, this presentation went so smoothly. So thank you to everybody that took part, and especially to everybody that joined us today. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed this. Uh, we do look forward to your feedback when the surveys are sent around, and we do hope that you will join us next week when we're gonna be able to hear from Dr. Vivek Shandas, and he will be presenting on how to use in-situ data uh, to derive land surface temperature with satellite data. So please join us next Tuesday. Thank you for joining us and stay safe.